Hey everyone, welcome back to The Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm joined by two very special guests, Dr. Kate Rogers and Dr. Ryan Mullins. These two are top scholars in the field of classical theism and models of God, so this should be a wonderful conversation. So Kate, first of all, thank you for coming on, and can you give us just like a 45-ish second introduction to you and your work? Well, sure. Uh, first, let me say thanks to, uh, to you, Joe, and to Ryan for inviting me, and uh, I think it'll be interesting. Um, so when I was a freshman in college, long, long, long ago, I read the work of St. Anselm, and he seemed about right to me. And in succeeding decades, um, you know, I've reread him and reread him, and he's always seemed just about right. So I have devoted much of my career to um, sort of bringing Anselm's uh, thinking into uh, the sort of contemporary analytic uh, scene, uh, especially his work on time, uh, God and time, and uh, his work freedom, human freedom. And so I've got a couple of books on that, uh, Anselm on Freedom in 2008 and Freedom and Self-Creation in 2015. And, and in both of those, I'm just trying to argue that Anselm maybe manages to reconcile classical theism with um, really robust human freedom. Sweet. That, that's great. That's, that's awesome. Um, so Ryan, can, can you tell us about you uh, just for the, I mean, I know surely mm -hmm. my audience already knows a lot about you, but maybe, maybe they're new to this conversation. So uh, just mm -hmm. make like a 45 second rundown for you as well. Yeah, so I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Helsinki at the Advanced, at the Collegium for Advanced Studies, and I've published a book on uh, the end of the timeless God in 2016, and then this new book, uh, God in Emotion, that just came out, what was that, August in 2020? And then I'm currently working on a book um, called From Divine Time Maker to Divine Watchmaker to follow up on these themes of like God and time. Sweet. So for the audience, we've essentially broken this conversation down into two kind of sections. So the first section would just kind of get a grip on classical theism and how it kind of relates to some of Kate's work. And secondly, in the second section, we're going to be considering objections to classical theism and how kind of Kate navigates those objections. And maybe we'll go back and forth and, and discuss those uh, amongst the three of us. So that's kind of the outline for the audience. And as usual, you can check the description for different links to uh, Ryan's stuff and some of, some of Kate's stuff. So let's get into that first section where we're kind of getting a grip on what classical theism is. And so Ryan, you kind of have the first question here, so I'll turn it over to you. Right. So, so Kate, as you mentioned, like you've done a lot of work on Anselm and you've really been pushing forward a lot of medieval philosophical agendas in very creative ways. But like, I mean, like we're living in this era where there's a lot of really exciting stuff being done in contemporary analytic philosophy of religion and philosophical theology. And you certainly are doing a lot of work in that area. But when you're doing that work, you're really pushing forward this like medieval framework. And so the, the question I had for you is like, why do you think we should push forward these medi medieval views? And then like what attracts you to medieval philosophical theology over just kind of like your bog standard analytic philosophy of religion? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, th th there's sort of um, a fundamental methodological approach question. And then there's kind of a, um, did they get it right <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the, the fundamental methodological approach question uh, I guess is is rooted in the fact that I'm I'm Roman Catholic, so you know I think that Jesus um, founded this this uh, community, and that the community is informed by the Holy Spirit, and um, down the so, so that the the reason he founds the community is so that we'd have this this real physical historical link to him, and, and then sort of down the ages. Um, I think it is safe to say that the majority of members of that community have recognized uh, folks like um, St. Augustine, St. Anselm, St. Thomas Aquinas as, as you know, among the, the very greatest uh, Christian thinkers that there have been. And so, um, of course, I'm going to be very loath to uh, sort of set my own personal reason just just against them you know and unless I'm you know I'm, I'm pretty sure of my um, my position um, and, and also I mean on the philosophical side it just I mean it seems to me that guys like Augustine and, and maybe it's easier to see in Anselm and Thomas Aquinas uh, they're they're as analytically sharp as anybody working today but 
they see themselves as working within this community, this, you know, that, that uh, founded by, by Christ. Um, and so what you get is, is I think, um, sort of an insistence upon systematization. They're, they're very systematic in their views. And it, because they're working within this community, it, it gives them this kind of breadth and richness that, that I think um, some contemporary analytic philosophers lack. Now, now my, my view, my impression is there are plenty of contemporary folks who would call themselves analytic philosophers of religion who, who are working within this, this very same tradition. Like, you know, you find Thomists who are, you know, just, just as analytically sharp as anybody could be. Yeah. Um, and yet they're, you know, adhering to Thomas Aquinas. Um, but but some, some contemporary analytic philosophers seem to um, take the most important factor to be their sort of private intuitions or, or maybe their private, um, their personal biblical interpretation, or, uh, I mean, some seem to have this idea that if they can't sort of picture God, if they can't, if, if the issue is how should we think about God, if they can't sort of imagine, make, make a nice picture, a little movie about, about God, then, then God can't be that way because they've got to be able to sort of completely picture God. And, and that seems to me to be, um, a failing, <laughs> and, and it's a failing that guys like Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas are, you know, are aware, aware of, mm. deliberately say we're not going to go that route. D does that sound? Yeah, because I, because I remember when I first read one of your one of your papers where you mentioned that you found it much more systematic and thinking that a lot of contemporary uh, analytic philosophy of religion, and I was like, no, that can't be right. And then I got deeper into the field, and I was like people really are just kind of like just treating as a hodgepodge of like, I can take that idea over there and this other one, how does it all fit together? I don't know. I don't care. And I was like, Kate was right. Then, you know, this is not systematic. <laughs> oh, no. What a nice way to start this program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I, I, I think that's true. And you know, and which is, you know, I mean, it's, which is fine, you know, to, to now I want to write a piece on this little issue and now I want to write a different piece on this little issue. But, but, you know, I mean, for me, um, I, I, I don't want to go it alone. I would rather attach myself to folks that I know are, you know, geniuses and uh, have something to offer. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. I think we can probably move on to, uh, to the second question that we have, um, if, if that's good. Um, so sure. in, your, uh, in your book, Kate, on perfect being theology, uh, you claim that everyone, for the most part, engaged in debates over different conceptions of God, assume that God is perfect. And so that might kind of serve as the foundation for further discussion, further inquiry into God, his existence, his nature, and his relation to the world. And so can you kind of give us an insight into what you mean when you say that God is perfect, and perhaps also tell us more about the method of perfect being theology? Yeah, yeah I realized um, when, when I read your question, isn't it funny how perfect has come to mean uh, just almost anything, you know, it's like you go to the grocery store and I mean, he gets a can of something and it's perfect, you know. Um, yeah, per perfect isn't, isn't a very useful word nowadays. Uh, but, but here's the method. Um, St. Anselm of Canterbury, in his Proslogion, says that, that uh, we ought to think of God as, if, if, if the issue is how are we trying to conceptualize God, th then we ought to start with the thought that God is that in which nothing greater can be conceived. Um, making a, a nice distinction, he does, between conceiving something like having some inkling versus comprehending, which means you've wrapped your mind all around it. You know, we, we, we're not comprehending God, but we're, nonetheless, we're, we're ambitious. We're, we're going to try to talk rationally about God. Um, and why start, and, and then he spends the rest of the proslogion trying to kind of unpack, um, you know, what what that could possibly mean. Um, but, but then somebody might say, well, why, why, why start there? Um, I mean, I, I, I presume that, well, I probably shouldn't say nobody, but m most, most people would think that God is worthy of worship and that God is the creator of the world. And, you know, if, if something wasn't that, <laughs> It, it just wouldn't be God. Mm -hmm. 
So, so then uh, someone like Anselm, uh, sounds right to me, goes, well, look, if, if God is worthy of worship and the creator, the source of all, then, you know, here, here we are and we're thinking about X and, and now we realize that Y is really greater than X. Um, X can't possibly be God because our little human conceptions you know, if, if, if we can think of something better, <laughs> given our radical limitations in terms of our experience and our just conceptual apparatus, if, if we can think of something better than this, it, it just seems incredible <laughs> to think that this would be the, the being we, we little human beings ought to worship. And, and of course, as, as the source of all, um, at least all, all the medievals, except maybe Occam, who was a wild man, but <laughs> my guys, St. Anselm, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, the A-team, um, that they would say that um, in order to be the source of all, you, you, you can't possibly be suffering the limitations that the created thing uh, exists under. That, that the source would have to be above and then transcend those, those limitations. And so again, would have to be that in which nothing greater can be conceived. Um, does, does that, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, certainly, I mean, some, some, <laughs> I hope Bill Hasker will forgive me because he's just a doll. I love him. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy and we're good friends. <laughs> we really are. But, but, you know, he's, he strikes me as kind of the, the poster <laughs> child for the kind of analytic philosophy that maybe I really kind of don't like. And, you know, and of course he would start with, with his interpretation of the Bible and he would say, well, look, you know, you're, you're starting with perfect being theology and it doesn't conform to my interpret, well, he wouldn't say my interpretation of the Bible, he would right. say you know, the Bible, I guess. Um, but you know, I mean, to, to me, it just seems um, really problematic <laughs> to say that we're, we're going to not embrace the thought that God is just the, you know, that in which we can't conceive any better. Oh, can't hear you. I am muted. Ah, <laughs> What's yeah. so about Zoom? Because <laughs> Skype has like an immediate thing where you can just press it super easily. But oh well, okay. we're, we're all good. <laughs> uh, times of COVID. Anyway, uh, so Ryan, um, do you have any follow-ups before you go on to your next question? Or No, I'm fine. I'm, I'm happy to go to the third question. Let's do that. Hmm? Okay. So the third question we had for you was just to kind of get into your understanding of classical theism. So I wanted to start with divine simplicity because in your own work, you offer a bunch of arguments from divine simplicity to other attributes like timelessness or immutability. Uh, so like simplicity is like, you know, a really important feature in, in your thinking here. So how do you understand the attribute of divine simplicity? That's too hard. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. Um, I mean, it really, it really is hard. Um, but guys like St. Anselm, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, they, a lot of times they tend to start there. Um, and, and everything else really does kind of uh, follow from that. So, so I, I mean, I'm just um, towing the party line here. <laughs> um, what it means to say that God is simple is that um, all of the attributes that we might apply to God, uh, omniscience, omnipotence, uh, perfect goodness. Um, in God, they are identical to one another, and that uh, being in which those are all identical uh, just, just is God. That is God's nature. That is God's essence. And, and, and his essence is to, to be this, um, I mean, it, it doesn't, to say God is an act sounds really funny to us, I think, because we always think, look, there's an actor and the actor can you know, sleep or sit around and then maybe get up and do something and that's their act. Um, the, 
if God is, is really simple, then God's being and his action just are the same thing, weird though it might sound to us. <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, it reminds me of, <laughs> no, I, I mean, it reminds me of, well, it, sense as an explication, as an explanation of the doctrine. Um, yeah, it's not to say that, uh, anyway. Um, so that, it reminds me of what um, I think, I believe Anselm said in, in some of his works where he's, you know, he's, a lot of his stuff is almost like a prayer to God in some of his works. And he's just like, uh, God, you are the very life by which you live, the very wisdom by which you are wise. And so like, he's, he's saying, if you're predicating of something of God, and we're doing it of God, not some kind of like Cambridge predication of something else, then God is that very thing that we are predicating of him, essentially. So like all that is in God is God. That's kind of a phrase that, that you often hear. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, that, that's a good explication of, of simplicity. Now, I'm wondering why we should think, um, at least in your lights, why we should think that simplicity is a perfection. So can you take us through that? Um, well, I, I can try. Um, th I mean, d d different people propose different kinds of of arguments. Um, so as, as you will, I mean, let's start with St. Anselm. There's a great place to start. Um, Anselm goes, look, if God is that in which nothing greater can be conceived, then let's imagine that God, you know, God sort of is composed of different, call them parts, but you, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be like, obviously not, you know, physical parts, but just as God, God is an amalgam of various different things. Um, you know, like you could imagine, a, I don't know, an angel who could be good or not good, wise or not wise. Uh, Anselm's thought is that if that's how you're thinking of this being, you, you could sort of pull that being apart, then that being could be decomposed. But any, any being <laughs> that can be decomposed can't possibly be that in which nothing greater can be conceived. Um, and, and here's Here's another argument that I, th I think it kind of hit me yesterday. So let me, let me try it on you, see what you think. And, and maybe somebody else has said this. Um, following upon that, when you read uh, ancient and medieval philosophers, a lot of them, they just go, look, anything composed of parts has to be caused. And of course, God can't be caused. And then you go, yes, but wh why, why did you say that? Why did you say that anything composed of parts had to be caused? Um, well, how, how about this <laughs> for here's why. Um, when you look around the world, you know, you see that all this stuff is contingent. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's the kind of uh, thing that, that had to have a cause. You, you'd think I was crazy if, you know, it's like, oh, there's a painting behind me. <laughs> it's uncaused. No, you, that's crazy. Um, there's a conceptual test for whether or not something is contingent, whether or not it's caused. And the conceptual test is, can you sort of imagine it having failed to exist? Can you imagine it, see, maybe it always existed, but can you imagine that it doesn't exist or that it could cease to exist? Even if it happens, the past is eternal, the future is eternal and it's always existed, it, it happens to have always existed. Can you imagine that it not exists, that it could start or stop existing? In that case, it's contingent, it requires a cause. Well, if, if you bought the thought <laughs> that anything with any kind of real parts could be decomposed, then you would say, ah, you know, that conceptual test for whether or not this thing is contingent and uh, hence requires a cause, it, it you know, <laughs> the, the test succeeds in that case. It is a contingent thing. It's got to require a cause. So what, what, what always looked to me like kind of an assumption that I wasn't quite sure about, <laughs> um, I, I think you could use that, that simple point of Anselm's to kind of, kind of uh, defend it. Does that, does that sound? Yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> no, I mean it's funny because I actually um, 
I have a video on Leibnizian cosmological arguments coming out. It's based on Alexander Proust's um, entry in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. And in a section in there near the end, he tries to infer, or you know, he, he gives some reasons for, for inferring divine simplicity from necessary and uncaused, because you know, he's trying to get to a necessary and uncaused being. And so I go through a bunch of different, bunch of different types of responses on this. So this is kind of fresh in my mind, but I oh, guess I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing here, just one short thing, and then I'll turn it over to Ryan to see if he has any kind of things that he wants to like, you know, gently push back on, um, <laughs> as gentle as Ryan could be. Uh, so I guess one thing that I want to think is like, I guess I find that plausible, that thought plausible for like, you know, this multiplicity of distinct kind of discrete units or elements that are arranged together in some kind of functionally integrated way. So, you know, when I think of like a human where we have these different physical parts and they're really complexly arranged uh, and functionally integrated, it does seem to me that that is something that couldn't be ultimate, that that is something that would probably, the parts and, and their unity would require some kind of outside cause. But when I get to something where its parts are all kind of, I don't know, there's a kind of intelligible unity to them. It's like we can see why and how they are united together of themselves. And, it's, and we can see that it would be metaphysically necessary that those parts be absolutely united together in all possible worlds. So I'm thinking of something like the property of being triangular and the property of being trilateral. Right, so those two properties are distinct, right? And so uh, those two properties, at least if we understand in the classical theistic sense of the term, it seems as though those would count as parts. But it's not clear to me that those two properties need some kind of out outside cause that kind of keeps them together or sustains them, but rather there's a kind of intelligibility there in and of themselves. They kind of have a metaphysical necessity of being glued together, as it were. Um, and the same we could say with like a, the property of having a radius and the property of having a circumference, say. Um, and so if that's the case, well, then we could perhaps take a, maybe a, a non-classical theistic god who is a perfect being, and they might have distinct attributes, but there's still a kind of intelligibility there. There's a metaphysical necessity of them being un unified and united together without a need for a cause. So what do you think about that? That, that's a super, super question. Um, I mean, I'm, so, so here's the first thought that occurs to me, and it may be useless, but we'll see. Um, I mean, it, it, it seems to me you might, you might run the, um, your examples the other direction and say, when we're thinking about the triangle, we separate out the, you know, the four angles and the sides, or, you know, whatever, I'm sorry, whatever you said. Um, but in reality, the triangle is a, is a simple figure. And um, in itself, I mean, it's not, it's not simple the way God is, I guess. But, but in itself, these things that we could tease out of it uh, really are, are inseparable. Mm -hmm. That they are kind of like different ways of talking about the same phenomenon. So, so, so let me just mention, I don't, I don't know if this helps anybody. <laughs> um, uh, Jeff Speaks has a, an, an interesting book that I reviewed called um, uh, The Greatest Possible Being. And, and in it, he uh, ignores simplicity. <laughs> and, and ignoring simplicity uh, comes to the conclusion that because, because you're looking at these different uh, divine attributes, omniscience, omnipotence, uh, perfect goodness, in, in isolation, that uh, none of those attributes really uh, has to be applied to the, the best possible being because uh, you can imagine a being that had that attribute. Uh, it was omniscient, it was omnipotent, but it was evil. And so it's not as good as a being that's almost omnipotent, almost omniscient, and really good. Um, and and he, he, you know, he kind of runs this really interesting book, <laughs> very smart, and, and he runs this you know, sort of all the way through showing that, that there's something kind of ultimately incomprehensible in the very, very um, project of trying to think of, you know, the greatest conceivable or possible being. But the reason he can do it is that he left simplicity out. And so if, if what we're doing is trying to think about, but because it, if a simple being, you know, the omnipotence is the omniscience, is the goodness, and you can't tease them apart, um, if, if what we're doing is trying to 
think about God, and then it turns out, if Jeff speaks is right, that if, that if you try to uh, treat these, these properties as, as if they were different, distinct properties, th then, then you can't conceive <laughs> of, uh, you know, a, a, a greatest possible being or that in which nothing greater can be conceived. Um, you know, I, I, th then it turns out that guys who started with simplicity were right <laughs> because even though, you know, even though these, these uh, properties, you know, you can't, they're not like, like body parts, you know, that you put over here and over there, um, failing to think of them as even, you know, more unified than just they're all in God, <laughs> really unified, just imagining them all as sort of there, there's God, and then he's got these properties, um, means that the whole project fails. So again, it seems like simplicity is, is really important. Yeah, Ryan, something tells me, did, did, okay, so I know Josh reviewed it. I know that mm -hmm. Oppie, I think, reviewed it. Didn't you review it, Ryan? Yeah, I, I did. I knew, um, I knew it. I'm not fully prepared to speak about Speaks at the moment, um, but uh, <laughs> see what I did there? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, but my general impression was he was really playing hard to get, and I kept thinking the method of proving theology is not as difficult to, to grasp as you're trying to make it out to be. And I remember when he was presenting some of the earlier material, and I was at Notre Dame. I remember I think I said that to him as well. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, this is a lot easier to get than you're than you're making out. Um, but I don't see what simplicity would do here, and I guess here's why. So. If I wanted to do kind of like some of the moves of like, well, you know, he's like, God's perfectly good. He's like, oh, he's all powerful. Um, oh, but he's really, uh, you know, but he's, he's not all wise though. Like, you know, like I just kind of like mix and match these things. Then I can still say, but they're all simple. They're all same. Um, I was gonna... <laughs> yeah, so, so I guess I don't see what simplicity would be oh, doing okay. there. Do you see, like, yeah, I feel I mean, like I'm missing yeah, Simplicity all by itself certainly wouldn't give you God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, simplicity all by itself would give you, I don't know, Parmenides uh, one, you know, a homogenous spherical plenum or something. No. Sure. That's simplicity. Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, the, the, you know, the issue is how do we, how do we work on these, these you know, robust attributes that we mm -hmm. really think have to, have to be in God <laughs> somehow. Um, with without uh, ending up some somehow diminishing God. So if you if you plug in simplicity, then you get, you know, I think um, a, a nice robust uh, system, as opposed to you know, speaks saying it just can't be done. Mm -hmm. cool. All right. So uh, Ryan, do you have anything else to add on that? Because I would like to, you know, because we could we could I'm sure I'm certain that we yeah. could dwell on simplicity for the rest of the time because. All three of us are really super interested in this and have, have, have looked into it. I mean, obviously, Kate has looked into this the most, probably. <laughs> uh, but I, I am, I, I think we would like to go on to probably timelessness mm -hmm. now, uh, just so we can keep it rolling, because I know we would spend the whole day on simplicity. Uh, so, um, so, Kate, can you sort of take us through the uh, attribute of divine timelessness and, and why you think timelessness is a perfection? I mean, I know there's the kind of root that it's entailed by simplicity and you think that's a perfection, but maybe there's another root, <laughs> maybe there's another root that you think would work. Um, but yeah, can you, can you take well, us through what that is? And yeah, I mean, the, um, the, the, the way, uh, and, and again, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing, I, I think, I think I'm just interpreting St. Anselm. Now, you know, um, scholars disagree. And if this is really me and I came up with this myself, you know, good for me. I, I think it's Anselm. Um, his, his position is that, um, you know, God, God is simple. And um, my understanding is all, all of time, I mean, actual time, <laughs> is, is immediately present to God. So... Uh, I take his view to entail what I call isotemporalism, that, that all times exist equally. Um, sometimes it's called four-dimensionalism, and I don't really like that because, you know, who knows, maybe there's more dimensions or something. Um, and sometimes it's called eternalism, and I hate that because, um, you know, the eternal is always how, I mean, at least, well, not always, until the 1960s, how people describe God, you know, and so it's, of course, the temporal universe isn't eternal, so that makes no sense. Um, so I like I like isotemporalism because it captures that thought that that all time is is equally there. And what that means is, um, 
everything that happens, happened, or will happen. I mean, from our perspective, right? Um, we, we happen to be uh, right now at this moment looking, you know, at this time, uh, except for your viewers who are looking at some later time, but that's another story. Um, everything that's happened, happens, or is happening is it's all known to God. God is able to act. In fact, he does act upon everything that happens, happened, or is happening. And that is a much more uh, wild and enormous picture of God's omniscience and omnipotence than uh, it, anything that would sort of um, put God in time or or make time just be the, just the present moment. I mean, there's there's different theories of time, but you know the the thought that that it's all there for God. I, I think that you know that makes um, omniscience and omnipotence be much uh, larger too. I mean, besides solving all kinds of you know minor problems like you know does God have a plan for the universe and that kind of thing. Yeah, Ryan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for this. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's, I just, I guess I just want to just get some clarity. So, so for people listening, um, some of them might be familiar with terms like B theory of time or eternalism. And in your work, you, you, like you, like you said earlier, you're like, you hate the, the eternalism phrase because <laughs> it's supposed to be for God. Um, well, and but then, that's, and then people go, oh, are you saying that the universe, you know, exists in the same way God does, you know, it's like, right. well, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Why'd you use that word? Sorry. Right. So yeah, so that's just want to get clarity. So that way if people are following along. If they haven't read your stuff, that, that way they know that this is what you're talking about, but you're, you've got reasons for why you don't like the terminology. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we can go on to question five if you're, okay, if you're ready sweet. for that. So um, now let's, now let's, we've talked about simplicity and timelessness. Um, so we're talking a lot about the nature of God, but in models of God, there's also God's relation to the world. So now we can, kind of move on to the classical theistic understanding of God and creation. And so, uh, at least under, under your favored view, Kate, does God have to create or is he free to refrain from creating? Uh, and, and closely related to this is like, what kind of world would God create? Does he have to create like the best possible universe or a multiverse or things like that? So just take us through the, the God and creation. Thing. <laughs> well, here's, here's what I say. Um, and, and, um, Note that um, T Thomas Aquinas, for example, um, is is very insistent that that God could have done otherwise. Um, I I tend to kind of prefer, and maybe it's just you know having read, having read Anselm at such a young age, um, the the earlier more Neoplatonic folk like Augustine and, and Anselm. Um, the way I read them is that God inevitably creates. Um, I mean, I think I've got good texts to, to show that, but, but also for, for Anselm, he's, he's really careful to think about freedom in such a way that you, that you can use that word for God and human beings without having to say that God sort of debates about what he should do and, you know, dithers or whatever. Um, I mean, no, and, and some, as, as I read him, thinks that God just inevitably does the best. Does that mean this is the best possible world? Well, as I also read Anselm and plenty of scholars disagree, uh, I, I think he's defending a libertarian view of human freedom, not divine freedom. He's, you know, the, the mechanics of freedom work out really differently for God and human beings because we're so different, but the definition is the same. Um, and if, if that's right, then human beings do have somehow some kind of input. <laughs> and so the, the thing to say is, um, and, and, and God sets it up that way because having really free creatures is a really great thing. It's a better world to have them. Um, but so the best thing to say is God creates the best actualizable world given human choices. So, so maybe if human beings made some other 
different choices, things, you know, there in some sense could be better. Although, of course, God can bring, you know, ultimate good out of all that, all that evil. But, but, but I'd rather say actualizable than, than possible. Um, and, and then, you know, after that, so what kind of world is it? Ah, well, <laughs> this kind. Um, but, you know, what kind of world is this? Uh, my, my guys, especially the, well, that, Thomas Aquinas says this too, um, they're, they're very into um, th this creation, you know, the, the stuff in it is just, they just love it, you know, <laughs> they just think it is so cool. Um, they just go, I mean, on and on about how cool stuff is. And, and you know, they, they buy the principle, at least some of them, the principle of plenitude, that is, you know, the more the merrier on a cosmic scale. And, you know, so if the question is, uh, you know, what does the best actualizable world look like? Well, it looks like a world, you know, with just as many different kinds of things as there can be. Um, and, and then, you know, may, maybe that's a multiverse, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with a multiverse. <laughs> or, you know, if, it, if it's our universe with, you know, but way out and lots of stuff, that, that's fine too. So, you know, so I think that the thought of a best actualizable world is coherent, I, I don't think it undermines divine freedom unless you feel like God has to be able to, you know, really do otherwise than, than he has done. Um, and, and, and I really like the principle of plenitude. <laughs> I always thought that was just a great one. <laughs> okay, so I just want to make sure I'm following this. So, so God, it's inevitable that God creates. And what I, I God would is... Say that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so then what God creates is going to be the best, whatever the best world happens to be. If it's a multiverse or if it's only yeah. just one universe, whatever the best is, that's the one God's going to create. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, so you mentioned free will and, and you've written like a couple of like books on free will, a lot of papers on it. So, um, so the next question we had for you was if you could just kind of tell us a bit more, like what is, how do you understand human free will? Um, again, you know, what, what I'm doing is interpreting Anselm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in Anselm, I, we, we know that human beings must have some kind of free will because they sin, and Anselm thinks it's just logically impossible, logically impossible, that God caused sin. So, I mean, th that's kind of where where he starts and, and may, maybe he's just making too much of sin. You know, maybe if you didn't make so much of sin, you, you could happily end up elsewhere. But, but he start, kind of starts there. It cannot be the case that God is, is causing the sin. So um, I, I read him as a kind of libertarian. And I mean, this, this view I, it seems to me to make, make good sense. Um, it is... You're, you're, there you are, you're debating, right? You have this morally significant choice and you're debating, should I do A or should I do B? Um, and, and of course you're kind of drawn, uh, you, 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 don't, you don't pursue something unless you have some kind of motivation or some kind of desire. You're kind of drawn towards both of them, but uh, you, can't, you can't do both. And, and you know, to make it interesting, it's a morally significant choice. Um, you, you end up uh, pursuing B. I'm going to say that um, although everything that had any real ontological status in that picture <laughs> came from God, it was up to you that you pursued me, and, and you really had the ability to pursue A. And, and that you pursued B was up to you. Now, now get, given the time stuff, um, at every moment in time, in the past and in the future, uh, forever, right? Uh, if you choose B at time T, it's, it's true that you choose B at time T. So, you know, there's a logical sense in which you, you couldn't choose A because darn it, you chose B. <laughs> But you made it the case, right? That you that you choose B at time T. So, um, I mean, what the the hard part is trying to maintain, um, you know, God's creative uh, power 
and still leave, you know, just about, I don't know, a 16th of an inch for human freedom. Um, and, you know, I, I, th I think Ansel maybe does the best that can be done. Uh, and we can talk about that or we can, you know, go on to other, other stuff either way. Yeah, Ryan, what were you thinking here? Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I just had like a follow up just to make sure I'm getting some clarity on this. So we have libertarian freedom and I could have done otherwise. It just happens to be this temporal part of me is doing whatever I'm doing um, now. And God is causing all the good stuff and he's not causing any of the bad stuff. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, just about that? <laughs> yeah, I can actually. I, don't, I mean, so, so uh, point one, right? Um, God provides the motivations. Is God motivating us to, to head towards evil? No. Uh, Anselm has this really interesting uh, complex analysis involving um, uh, first order and second order um, choice, willings, motivations, uh, in, in which um, he, the, the thought is, you know, we, we wouldn't choose anything at all if we didn't think it was gonna be some kind of benefit for us. And, and that's fine, that's just the way we're supposed to be. The problem comes in when some, for human beings, I mean, see animals have it easy, right? They just, they just go for what they want and they're cool. Um, we are able to recognize that some um, things are to be pursued you know, now or in a certain way or whatever, you know, that, that some of those things that, that look to make us happy and, and on some level really could make us happy, nonetheless, it's, we shouldn't pursue them now. <laughs> or we shouldn't, you know, for some reason, they're not the thing to do. So now we have this setup, right? Where mm -hmm. you've got these, these kind of options. And it's not that God gave you any motivations towards evil, because evil, of course, is, is nothing in this tradition. Um, you're just, you know, pursuing the the wrong the wrong object um so, so the answer to the question one you know did god give us motivations for evil is just no but how does that um how, how does that choice actually work Here, here's i mean it's i i have the text for it so i you know i and, and i as i say i think it it might be about the best one can do um, absolutely everything with any kind of ontological status, anything that is a thing uh, that exists, okay, has to come from God. God is the source of everything that exists. So St. Thomas goes, well, your act of choice is an existing thing. Even if you're choosing to sin, it's an existing thing. God must cause it. God causes the act of sin, you know, says St. Thomas. Um, you know, but it's okay because, you know, he's got a plan and it's part of the plan. Um, and Anselm, as I read him, doesn't do that. Here, here's Anselm. Um, you have these competing motivations. I have to pantomime. It's better if I was standing. <laughs> but you have these competing motivations. For, for A and for B, right? And, and B is the, the bad, the thing you shouldn't be pursuing now. But, but you know, you want these, both of these things, both of the motivations are God-given, you're pursuing both of them. At a certain point, you pursue one such that the other ceases to be viable. I, I think you gotta say, if, if the goal is God doesn't cause the sin, then you've got to say it was up to you. It was up, the, the motivation was, was God given, the power in the sales all came from God, but you, you could have pursued B and then A would have dropped out, but you pursued A so that B dropped out. Um, my, my analogy for, for what it's worth is imagine, um, imagine uh, Ryan and I are having a race. <laughs> don't, don't imagine it too vividly. Uh, and Ryan is, you know, being, being so kind, he gives me a big head start. And so I'm kind of trying to run and, you know, he comes along and he zooms past me. Um, what I want to say, I, I think this is, this is okay. Um, you know, Ryan and I both exist. And even, you could even say our powers of running exist. 
And if you're, if you're fairly liberal in what you want to say, you know, assign ontological status to, you could even say maybe the, maybe the running <laughs> sort of has some kind of existence. It's the passing that counts, right? Because he's going to win if he passes. But the, pa the passing, I'm calling it a thin event. That is, it's, it's an event, and you could, you could see what time it happens and everything. And it might be really important. He might win a million dollars. It's this strange philosopher's race, right? Um, but the, the passing doesn't add anything to what there is in the universe. So <laughs> I want to say the, the choosing, right, is the, is the moment at which you were pursuing the two and then you pursued this one such that that one dropped out. It is a thin event. I mean, it might be, it might be super important, but it doesn't, it's not itself ontologically existing. Now, does that mean that I have to say that stuff is happening that God isn't causing? Uh, I, I think so. I just, I don't see any way around that. You know, I, if, if you wanted to say God causes everything that happens, which guys like Thomas Aquinas want to say, um, you know, that then you, you bite the bullet on God causes sin. But, although it's all good for him to do it, um, but, but, if, but if, you, if you just can't stand that, then I think you have to figure out some way of, at least this, this seems to be Anselm's approach, that everything is from God. God causes everything that has any kind of ontological status. But there's a few things events, <laughs> thin events that he doesn't cause that are up to us and, and that's our, our free choices. So, so ev everything in the choice is from God. The pursuing this over that is, is not. <laughs> no, that, that, I mean, that's good. We'll probably, we might be able to cover that when we go over the, um, the occasionalism objection that Ryan wanted to say. So maybe now we can move on to like the section two, the objections perhaps. Sure. So you could, could do that. So now we're moving on for the audience to section two, where we're considering certain objections to classical theism. So the first one we're gonna consider is modal collapse. So modal for the audience just means the study of possibility and necessity. And when you have a collapse, that means you're kind of collapsing distinctions between certain modal distinctions that we might make, like between contingent and necessary. And so the modal collapse objection says, oh, that happens when there's, that occurs when there's only one possible world, when everything is absolutely necessary. And so this is a worry that some have leveled towards divine simplicity, namely that it entails modal collapse. The reason that these people, that these authors level for thinking that is that, well, part of simplicity is that all of God's actions are numerically identical to one another and numerically identical to God. And so, as you point out, and you pointed out earlier in this discussion, God just is an act, right? And so um, it would seem that under this view that God's act to create this world is identical to God. Well, if it's identical to God, so some of these authors have argued, well, then it cannot be any other way because God himself cannot be any other way. God is necessary. Uh, if two things are identical, they can't have different ontological status. So, so these thinkers argue. And so Ryan, like I said, Ryan has published on this and, and he's got some papers in the works on this, as do I, we've got some papers in the works on this. But um, uh, I'm wondering how you, Kate, in particular, go about responding to this modal collapse objection. <laughs> I respond by renaming it and preferring to talk about modal simplicity. I, I have a, a student who, Carl Nozadze, my wonderful student, who said, let's just call it modal simplicity. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, now, I mean, I'm, I'm going to bite the bullet on modal simplicity. I'm going to say, look, the collapse has this horrible word, like it's going to fall on you and crack your skull, but no. All, all we're saying is that what, what is, is, you know, the actual world is, is the actual world and, you know, in, end of story. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I mean, there's a, there's kind of a linguistic issue. Um, yeah, but, but don't we always talk about, you know, counterfactuals? And, you know, I'm going to say, well, yeah, we do. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, as long as a, a counterfactual can have a truth value, uh, as long as it's translatable into 
a claim about the actual world. Um, but, but, you know, the, and, and again, like with the human freedom, I mean, that's, that's one thing, you know, you might go, but, but now you're saying that people have to do what they do. And I'm going, no, um, you know, if, if Ryan is actually sitting here now, he cannot possibly be doing, he cannot fail to be sitting here now, right? <laughs> Logic works and good thing too. Um, but, you know, with, with isotemporalism and divine simplicity, uh, it just happens that, you know, ev every moment is like the present in that you can't be doing anything other than you're doing. Well, you know, why would you want to? Um, you know, so everything is, is what it is. Um, and, and the language, I mean, it, it might make it hard to translate into the predicate calculus because then you're going to have to be really careful how you think about possible worlds and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it, it seems to me like any counterfactual that has a truth value uh, can be translated into um, a, a claim about the actual world. So I'm not, I'm not really worried about the linguistic issue um, in, in terms of human freedom. You know, I'm going, look, it's, it's, it's in your power to do A or B. And if you do B, you know, you're the one that did it. You made it the case that from all eternity, you chose B at time T. But, you know, there's no, um, that, that doesn't logic, un unless you think that logic is going to infringe on your freedom, um, you, it's cool. So now, now, now again, guys like Thomas Aquinas think that that puts this radical limitation on God. Um, my, my, and, and I could be t entirely wrong about this. My suspicion is that it has to do with the fact that he's working uh, in, in the middle of the 13th century when um, the, the uh, Averroes and the, the Muslim philosophers have been saying they, they've been treating God as sort of this, this distant uh, one, kind of like Plotinus is one who's, who is not an agent who can act in the world. And, and of course, we, we don't want that. <laughs> um, we have to say God is an agent who can act in the world. So, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if Aquinas is insisting, because Aquinas doesn't think that human beings have to have libertarian freedom. Um, and yet somehow we're, res we're free and responsible. Uh, but, but, you know, somehow God has to be able to do other than he has done. And, and I just don't, um, I don't see the philosophical motivation for that. So, so just to make sure I'm, I'm getting this. So you don't want to call it a modal collapse, um, but you, because you want to call it like modal simplicity. Um, but it, it sounds really, better. It sounds better. That's fine. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, but the, but the story is like the actual world is it's, it really is the only possible world in, yeah. in some sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm doing, you want to say I'm freely doing it. Yeah. yeah I, I can't do it otherwise, uh, but that doesn't matter. Cause that's, that's what I'm freely doing. And, yeah. and I wanted to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And same thing with God, like, could God have created another world? Uh, no, 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 because this is the best world. And why, what would it even mean for God to do otherwise? But like, he's freely done it because then here he is doing it right now. Well, not now, well, I mean, but the, um, the difference timelessly. is that, that um, you really could, could in terms of, of, terms of your abilities, you really could have chosen otherwise. And mm -hmm. had you chosen otherwise, it would have been true from all of time that you chose A rather than B. Whereas, um, you know, I, I, I'm, really happy with the thought that God being perfectly good, um, you know, does the best, I mean, has to create because creating is such a good thing and has to create the best. I mean, has to in the sense that, you know, he's God and this is how he is. Whereas you, you don't have to do the best. Right. <laughs> you could do otherwise. And I often don't do you the best. You are doing so. the best, but you're, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. So it sounds like we're working almost with a more like compatibilist type type freedom where it's like the, the well, role of human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, well, it depends on how you define compatibilism, right? Mm -hmm. but, I mean, I, I want to insist that absolutely nothing, <laughs> nothing about you, nothing about God, nothing about the universe, um, causally, necessi causally necessitates mm -hmm. you choosing B, right? Absolutely nothing. But <laughs> if you choose B, then I want to say, in, in choosing B, you make it the case that you choose B. And suppose yesterday you, you, you chose B. Um, it is true to say today, well, gee, 
um, he could have done otherwise. He could have chosen A. In one sense, that's true in terms of your power, in terms of every single cause that we could possibly talk about, and, and don't even start on Molinist counterfactuals because I just hate those. I know, yeah, I know you don't like that, yeah. Yeah, just, just hate them. Um, in terms of everything, uh, except the fact that you chose B, you, you could have chosen A, right? But, but, but in a sense, it's true to say, well, if he chose B yesterday, he, he couldn't have chosen A yesterday because A is not B and he can't choose, you know, B and not B in the same way at the same time, right? So, so if, he's, if you're okay with it for yesterday, just multiply that across all of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so, to be sure, to, for the audience, just to be sure, yeah. when we're saying he, we're talking about like a human agent in, in this case, right? So for, for God, um, God necessarily, as, as you said, God necessarily sort of outpours his being onto creation because it's so good. So yeah, yeah. The, the, the point is to, to well, uh, so, so, so um, here's Anselm, and I agree. Um, the, the, the point of freedom is that you be able to, I mean, in any agent, be able to sort of, um, uh, produce things from themselves so that so that you can really have some input and some responsibility in well for human beings how you're um, uh, attuned to the good <laughs> or or not as the case may be um, so, so it's really the, the issue is really aseity from oneselfness and of course God exists absolutely ase absolutely independently he doesn't need any open options human beings get this little tiny sliver of aseity of our from our selfness because we have open options so it's really important for human beings to have open options but it, you know but in order for us to have something from ourselves when we're absolutely ontologically dependent on god but there's you know there's that that motivation has nothing to do with god <clears throat> is that okay <laughs> Ryan, do you have anything? <laughs> uh, no, so I just wanted to clarify one thing. So it's kind of like you're taking like the necessity of the present and then just saying it applies to all the moments of time. And since the necessity yeah. of the present doesn't undermine my free will, yeah. well, since I'm applying it to all the moments of time, then what's the big deal? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's all present. <laughs> right. Yeah. Really? So now we can perhaps move on to, um, so we covered modal collapse. Now we're going to move on to, uh, or modal simplicity. Now we're going to move on to, <laughs> now we're going to move on to the problem of evil and life after death. So this is kind of a view that some thinkers uh, have leveled towards the conjunction of either some versions of theism with uh, isotemporalism or eternalism or with Christianity in particular and isotemporalism. So if we have an eternalist or isotemporalist ontology of time and a perdurantist or four-dimensionalist view of persistence through time where things persist by having temporal parts at those different times, someone might complain that this exacerbates the problem of evil. So maybe even it undermines any coherent notion of life after death. And so here's why someone might think that. On eternalism or isotemporalism, the entire block of time is co-eternal with God. There's no state of affairs where God exists without the block of time. All of the evil things that are happening at various times coexist with God. All of the person stages or temporal parts that suffer at their respective times never get release from their suffering. They never get to enjoy the goods of heaven, those particular temporal parts, those temporal stages. And they can also never even get to say, thank goodness that is over. It seems that on this view, there is no life after death for those suffering person stages and no justice for those suffering person stages or temporal parts of persons. So I'm wondering how you respond, Kate, to this particular worry. <laughs> that, that's a great one. Um, let, let me try and you can see what you think. Um, you, you, you could also add in, uh, you know, it, it isn't, it isn't just the suffering, but also the, the uh, doing evil, right? At, suppose at some point you, I mean, I'm sure you didn't, but you know, you did some terrible evil thing um, and, and maybe you've repented, you know, and, and, and your sin has been washed away in the blood of the lamb. Um, but, but on isotemporalism, you know, it, it, it's there, right? It's there in the universe. Um, here, here's, let, let me try this. First of all, I'm not, I don't, I don't quite like the way the question is put, you know, no offense, but um, 
the the stages thing um, th that seems to me to be uh, just a manner of speaking um, because you don't you don't actually at least I, I don't think time is actually a bunch of little discrete um, atoms I don't think we get time atoms I, I think it's a continuous thing so what you are is some people will say like a time worm, but I don't like that. I, I prefer a ribbon. I think a ribbon would be much, <laughs> not, not that philosophers engage in rhetoric at all. <laughs> just, just an, if you were going to engage in a ribbon is much nicer. Um, so, so, so on the Christian view, right, your, your ribbon, you know, has a beginning and then it goes on to infinity. You have this, you are this infinite ribbon. Um, so, so I think that having said that, um, there's, there's two ways to go. One, one way is to say, well, look, uh, given that the ribbon is infinite, um, those, those moments of suffering or sin are just kind of swallowed up and disappear and we don't, you know, have to worry about them. Um, I, I would, I mean, this is just sort of an emotional, you know, I, you can see if, <laughs> if either of these work at all. I, I kind of would rather say something like this. Um, even for that, so, so suppose for the sake of argument, and we all hope and are saying our prayers, that, that you know, we, we have an eternity of beatitude. Um, it, it seems to me like part of your self is, is that saved sinner, or is that um, person who suffered through that terrible experience, which presumably um, you know, in, in, in that you are now experiencing this, or, you know, in, in, the, in the whole of you, I don't know how you see yourself. I mean, that, that's one I haven't really, you know, do you see yourself as God sees you? Do you see yourself as an infinite ribbon? Or are you still experiencing yourself as, you know, a momentary being? But, but, but either way, it seems like it's probably better <laughs> for, for you to kind of have that life experience as, as part of you. I mean, I guess if you're experiencing an eternity of misery, that feels different. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, it's, it, I, so, so that's why I don't like the time stages, right? I Because I, that acts, seems like it's this whole succession of little guys. And, and that's not it, right? It's, it's you're, you're this uh, unified, coherent person over time. But, but my own feeling is it's, it's maybe better for you to kind of include in, in that infinity of, of joy the fact that you've suffered and you've sinned and, and repented and all that stuff. Um, so, so, okay, so, okay, so I, can, I can see that like calling it a ribbon is better because if I called <laughs> Joe a space-time worm, like it sounds bad. Um, but if I'm being a Calvinist, then I'm going to say, like, I'm a worm anyway. Um, but I'm not a Calvinist, so I don't have to worry about that. So I can do the ribbon thing. That's fine. Um, but usually on these stories, though, even if you do have this kind of perdurantist sort of account, instead of wanting to do stage theory, they'll still have these, like, temporal parts that exist at every instance. So, like, Catherine Holly's going to say these uh, stages or these parts, they're as fine-grained as instance. And so if we've got continuous time, then it seems like I'd have an infinite number of um, of these like parts, temporal parts, right? Because uh, if you don't want to get have the discrete, then then times like infinitely divisible, and so then I'd have these. So my ribbon, in one sense, begins in 1983 and goes till uh, hopefully and on into eternity and forever, <laughs> amen. Um, but there's going to be an infinite number of uh, instants leading throughout that. So. In one sense, like cool, like the hope I'm assuming uh, I've got parts of me in heaven that are just enjoying the beatific vision. So there's an infinite number of parts there, but also like a bunch of points in like in my life where that's have just been awful. Um, there's an infinite number of parts there too, and so I'm like, ooh, uh, I got like I got some infinite joy, but I got some infinite misery. I I don't like the the picture as as if somehow those were, you know, th those those parts. <laughs> separate from the you know <laughs> infinity of joyful parts so i mean i don't know do you, do you think in heaven you won't remember suffering or you won't remember suffering? well i so usually how the story goes is how you get the the unity between them is there's some kind of um what's called like an imminent causal relationship 
uh, like so like one part imminently call, like causes the, the very immediate next one to have the same kind of like biological features, the same kind of psychological features. And that's how you're supposed to get like this kind of uh, uh, space time ribbon instead of a space time worm. <laughs> um, so that's, that's usually how the story goes. And so that's why like, I don't have uh, the memories of what's happening um, later. I only have the memories of what's happening, what's happened before. And so it'd be the same thing. Like that's why I can't currently at, well, the, the part of me here and now cannot experience the beatific vision. Whereas um, the parts of me that are there, they're going like, yeah, remember that time you spoke to Kate about this, you know? <laughs> um, so that's, that's the usually kind of story that a lot of like perdurantists will tell. And you can just reject all that if you want. But, um, but, but I, you yeah. know, I just haven't really um, thought enough about it. To, and, and again, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure it makes a difference to the, the basic, as, as, as long as it's all joined, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's person, it's all you. Uh, I, I think the thought that um, the, the claim that the suffering should simply disappear from your existence or the sin should simply disappear from your existence, that, that that's just an obviously good thing. Um, that I guess that, that's what I'm questioning. Okay, so you, so I guess I was trying to think of how to help you out here. So it would be some kind of greater good uh, defense you want to build into it uh, or, or some sort of like, what's the, what's the phrase that Marilyn Adams uses, like an organic unity uh, and how the goods are brought about, something like that? Um, well, I guess it's just, you know, if, if you really suffered, then darn it, that's, that's part of who you are. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that uh, every instance of suffering is necessarily overbalanced by a good, you know, mm. I, I believe in hell, but sure. <laughs> only for, you know, just reasons of faith, not mm. if there's no hell, I'm going to go cool. I, I'm so glad. Sure. I won't complain to God if that's the case, you know, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, so, but it's, it's just that it's, and I guess I don't see, I mean, since it's your suffering, it's not, I, someday I may write a paper on this. I mean, I don't see, I don't, people talk about, you know, well, you know, suffering can bring about good and this and that. Um, but, but, but let's talk about suffering sort of in the abstract, you know, in the abstract in itself, suffering is just bad. But, but there is no suffering in the abstract, right? It's always mm -hmm. someone suffering. Mm -hmm. so the suffering of this unified person who is now in, who, well, now, I mean, who, however that looks on the other side, who is enjoying an eternity of beatitude, to, to me, there just seems something wholesome about retaining that. Okay, I, I have nothing more to add on that, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And, and you know, like this, um, or like I said, with simplicity, this is also another one. I mean, lower, like temporal ontology, persistence, <laughs> and, and afterlife. I mean, you, we can go on forever for this one, but maybe we can move on. I am worried of the time. We're about one hour and eight minutes in. And I know we said between 75 and 90 minutes. So maybe, you know, we've got a little less than 20 minutes left. So um, now we can move on to uh, Ryan's question on whether or not eternalism helps with timelessness. So I'll turn mm -hmm. over to you, Ryan. Okay, so so let's see here. So this is the objection goes like this. Um, so so it seems to me like this eternalist ontology or this isomorphist uh, ontology, it, it seems like it could help the classical theist in a couple different ways. So like there's this classic problem of like does God know what time it is now? And since you've got this isotemporal kind of story, you could just go, man, there's no objective now, so doesn't really matter. There's nothing there for God to know. Uh, oh gosh, God doesn't know things that there aren't to know. So like it's not a problem. Um, but I'm kind of curious if eternalism really is going to help out with other things. So like this isotemporal kind of view, it still affirms that the world contains change and succession. And then you have God being wholly present to each moment of time and thus wholly present to all of change and all of succession that's going on in the world. And so I've got this worry that's what's called the problem of temporary intrinsics. And so if God is going to be like wholly present to Moses in the burning bush, uh, and then he's wholly present to our conversation right now, then it seems like God's going to have these incompatible properties, like speaking from the burning bush and not speaking from the burning bush. And the way that people who typically affirm eternalism or isotemporalism, um, what they do to, to avoid the problem of temporary intrinsics is they'll appeal to like temporal parts. And so like, it's only that temporal part that's doing the burning bush stuff. Um, and this other temporal parts doing this other thing, but you can't have that with like a timeless God though, because it seems like 
well, a timeless and simple God just can't have temporal parts. So yes. I'm kind of curious, like what you might think of this, this objection. How would you try to deal with it? Yeah, I, I, I'm having I'm having trouble kind kind of getting it um, because I mean I'm going to want to say um, at any point in time, uh, you know, a speaker at that point who utters the proposition. God is speaking out of the burning bush to Moses at time, I don't know what, what time that is, time M, okay, um, at time M, um, that's just true at, at any point in time. So there's, there's never a time when God is not speaking to Moses at time M, right? Well, the tenseless fact that he speaks at time M, like that, that proposition, that, that doesn't change its truth value. But yeah. it would also be the case that God's not speaking right. to Moses at, you know, time T at, or time exactly. U. Yeah, but that where I don't see where the contradiction is. Okay, so maybe I didn't set it up quite right. So um, the way the temporary intrinsic problem goes is, if I'm wholly located at multiple points, then I'm going to have these incompatible properties like sitting and standing. So it is the case definitely that I'm sitting at you know time T at, at, at X and then standing at time T N. But if I'm wholly located at both of them. Then I'm going to have these incompatible properties. Um, is is the way yeah. the story usually goes? That, that that seems clearly false about hmm. that though, right? I mean, because I mean, to take the spatial analogy, right? We, I mean, um, presumably, I mean, it's, it is standard to say. I, I guess you guys say this: God is wholly present in Cincinnati, and God is wholly present in New York City, and New York City is not Cincinnati, mm -hmm. uh, and yet we don't say there's a contradiction here. God is present in Cincinnati and not present in Cincinnati. I mean, he's present in New York City and he's sure. in Cincinnati, wholly present. So, so God is wholly present to time, you know, TM, or maybe better to say time TM is wholly present to, is wholly present, yeah, wholly present to God, is, would have to be wholly present, uh, and, and time, you know, TM uh, plus three is wholly present to God. Uh, without just like Cincinnati and New York, right? Mm. Without that entailing any contradiction. Uh, I guess I'm not seeing this this tr like strict analogy between time and space because, sp like with with the time case, like the moments are one way, and could be subsequently otherwise. Uh, whereas with spatial locations, like that's not the case. Um, with spatial locations, whereas with temporal ca locations, like what's happening then is what's not happening at the next moment because change on these sort of isotemporal stories is usually about things having incompatible properties at different times. So I guess it's just trying to see like how some of these pieces fit together with isotemporal uh, and, and this timeless God. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not understanding the, I mean, that with, with you know, the, the analogy with space is you would say, well, look, um, I'm here in Newark and um, I'm not there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, you're there, but I'm here, uh, and and yet you know what what is here to God? Well, you know where you are and where I am, um, and God is holy, you know where I am and He's holy where you are, and yet you aren't where I am. Um, you know, do, does that mean if 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 God is holy here and and holy over here, and and these two places are really distinct? You know, how how does it happen? Mm -hmm. There's no contradiction in God. Well, it's because all of space is in God and all of time is in God. And so whatever, whatever God is doing, he's just doing. And, and, you know, quote, from our perspective, it's, you know, or, well, really, it's, you know, it's time T or T plus X or whatever, T plus three. But mm -hmm. God, you know, God is just doing it all at, at once for God. So, well, uh, you guys have succeeded in uh, bamboozling me. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, Ryan, do you have anything before before we move on to the the next or to the final question? Or uh, just wanna... one short follow up question okay. because I don't because yeah, we sh we need to get to the next one. Um, it's, so I guess I'm kind of curious then what would motivate you to hold to this like ribbon view of personal identity over time instead of like an endurancist account? Because typically, because like typically the reason people reject like an endurantism and in favor of like this sort of ribbon view is because of the problem of temporary intrinsics. Well, I mean, the, the, it seems to me like the ribbon view just fits better. I mean, I, the okay. thing that 
I don't start from metaphysics. I start from God sure. and, and have everything else follow from there. Yeah. It just seems to, you know, if, if God is really, you know, if all of time is really present to God, then, then that's reality. And it, and it seems like that would mean that my existence, which to me seems to be, you know, across these moments of time, would, would all be immediately present to God. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing it to solve a metaphysical sure. per, this per se problem. It just seems to make more sense. <laughs> I'm going to like, follow up with some of your, either one or both of you on this, because I've got some like competing intuitions both ways, but I, I, I you know, I, I want to let you guys talk for this, so I'm not going to comment further, but I have some competing intuitions in favor of both of you guys here. So maybe I can just reach out to you guys later. So that, with, that that being be said, <laughs> with, with that being said, we'll just um, we'll move on to the final question. And then, mm -hmm. and then after that, we'll round it out. So maybe, uh, maybe just like 10 minutes left uh, for our discussion. So Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so this one is, um, I'm going to call the, I can't believe it's not occasionalism uh, objection, um, is, is, is the way I'm trying to like work on it. Uh, so you've got this kind of thesis that some people are like calling universal divine causality, which is like where God's like causing all the things that, that exist that have this real existence and not this thin existence, I guess. Uh, and so that's affirmed by both occasionalist and people who affirm concurrentism. And so occasionalism says that God is the only genuine causal agent in existence. And concurrentists say that God gives human persons and other secondary causes like genuine causal power. Uh, and so concurrentism says that God's like the primary cause of everything and that creatures are the secondary cause of some things. Um, but however, this affirmation of like universal divine causality, like it kind of prevents me from seeing any significant difference between the two. And then here's why. So universal divine causality says that God causes everything, including my thoughts, my desires, my actions. Well, why do I exist? Well, because God directly caused me to exist. Why do I have the thoughts that I do? Well, it's because, you know, God caused me to have those thoughts. Why do I have the desires that I do? Well, God directly caused me to have those desires. And why do I perform the actions I perform? Well, God directly caused me to have those, uh, to perform those actions and so on. Could I have performed otherwise a uh, different action? Well, yeah, if you know, if God had directly caused me to, to perform a different action. And so that seems like, as I understand it, that's what universal divine causality is saying. So I'm kind of left asking then, like what's the difference between occasionalism and concurrentism? Because it looks to me like this universal divine causality just entails occasionalism. Uh, in which case, like there's gonna be such thing as human free will. Um, and you might want to go, well, hang on, like God gives creatures genuine causal power, but I'm kind of losing my grasp on what that would look like because on this divine universal causality, like God directly causes me to have the causal power and God directly causes me to exercise my power in a particular way. And then nothing here has really changed the, the analysis of the situation. Like it's still a case that they, the only, I only perform an action because God directly causes me to perform that action, which is precisely what the occasionalist has been saying all along. So how would you respond to like a worry like this? Um, I mean, the, the deeper worry is, is the human freedom worry. Yes. But, yeah. but, I mean, I, I, terminology, I think um, it, it's important to, you know, remember that occasionalism, occasionalism isn't uh, just the view that God causes everything. It's the view that God causes everything and there are no secondary causes. Right. Which, which has all kinds of metaphysical problems, you know, yeah. if you've got, you know, like, if, if, there's, if there's no sort of scientific causation going on then you know things you know just are not what we think they are mm. and st thomas because he really likes stuff and he really likes science is really insistent you know there's the secondary causation but as you say saying i mean i i think your your view pegs it for st thomas that you know no matter how much secondary causation you've got going on um the primary cause the thing that causes everything to exist is is God? There's no you know doubt about that. And so if you if you do what how I read Thomas, what he does is to say that the you know your actions are things, and therefore they've got to be caused by God. And you know even even if it's you know you you're the one that's willing this, but God is causing you to will it. Um, you know I mean I. <sighs> Don't want to get in trouble with anybody but you know it's just hard for me to see how you know how are you really responsible if god is causing you know i know you willed it i know you willed it because you wanted to but god made all that happen and and that's that's why i think you know genius as saint thomas is um you know i i think it's it's better to try to do the anselm thing and 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 you know, maybe what that 
I mean, I, when I was reading your question, I was like, uh oh, um, <laughs> you'll be glad to hear. Um, I mean, m maybe, you know, if, if, if what I want to say is God causes everything that's a thing, he just doesn't cause everything that happens, maybe I have to say, well, you know, it's, it's not really universal divine causality. It's almost universal divine causality or something like that. Um, but, but, you know, I think if, if, that, if that business about how choice works, if, if, if that's kind of okay or the best one can do, um, you know, I, th I think you can fit that real human freedom for which we can be responsible. I think you can kind of shoehorn that into th this, this universe of classical theism in, in which God, you know, causes everything that exists. But <laughs> nonetheless, some things are up to us. Because, I mean, and, and look, if you said, oh, well, no, God, God can't make creatures who have libertarian freedom. I mean, wouldn't, certainly a creature with libertarian freedom is something conceivable, I would think. So, you know, so aren't you placing a limitation on God if you do that too? So, so, so no, I mean, I think, I think basically you're, you're right. And, and I think you have what Thomas says, I think that that's it. Um, and you can call it occasionalism because he, you know, because he doesn't just sort of leech secondary causes out of the universe because they right. really have science um, grounded. But, um, but, but the problem of free will would, would be there for him. Yeah. All right, Ryan, do you have any follow-ups on that or? No, that's good. Okay, so I mean, I guess we could just go into like concluding <laughs> comments or anything. So I guess we'll turn it over to, to Kate for any like last words or any, you know, overall comments and then we'll turn it over to Ryan and then I'll close it out. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sort of curious about, um, I mean, are, are, were you guys just sort of curious about perfect being theology or I mean, is it, is it under attack where you come from or is it gaining <laughs> popularity or is it just considered weird or what? No, I mean, I, I'm just super interested in philosophy of religion. I mean, also I have interest in like metaphysics and things like that, but I'm also interested in philosophy of religion and in particular models of God, in particular classical theism and, and other non-classical <laughs> theism models. And so um, I just wanted to, to get a, a fun discussion between two kind of top scholars within classical theism and models of God to, have, you know, just to come on and talk about things. So that, that's really what I was, I'm, I'm here, I'm just here for interest, so. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, also, like, so Joe and I were, you know, we've done a lot of different, uh, a lot of these videos and, and I have my own podcast and everything. So trying to get like good scholarship out to the public in a way that's accessible and hopefully somewhat entertaining. That's a major <laughs> goal for us. And then some of the stuff that we, when, when we're interacting with people online, their misconceptions are just, oh, they're all over the place. Uh, so, so some of the questions we had for you, it was just like, well, I was like, I was like, this is a real scholar who says these things. It's not me just making this up. So we, we wanted to get you uh, out front so people can be like, here's a real scholar saying these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, great. Do, do, do you guys teach at all at this point? Oh, uh, my position at the moment is um, purely research. I'll have some teaching uh, next year, but for this year, I just get to just to do research. Uh, yeah, I, not, I was just uh, thinking of the incredulous question, which is sure. <laughs> one gets plenty of those. <laughs> I'm I'm just a I'm a student, but I also do a lot lots of lots of research. And Ryan and I actually have um uh, we got our proofs today for it. The um the article we have an article forthcoming in, in religious studies on <laughs> classical theism. So congratulations, yay, thank you. good for you guys. So uh, I guess I'll 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 end it out now. Uh, so hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly did. And um, what else? What better way to end than uh, I'm Josh Schmidt. This is the Majesty of Reason, and peace out.